As I begin this morning, I don't know if that's just my head, but I sounded awfully loud. Okay, that's good. I'm, I want the body to be in prayer for our brother Alan Beckel today. He was on the flight out to California with the hopes of being able to see his brother before he passed away. But mid-flight, uh, his brother passed away. And uh, our brother is, is wrestling uh, through the reality of the state of his brother in his death. And I encourage you to pray for Alan as he, as he grieves through this time, okay? Fitting, strangely enough, that we would mention that as we bring our thoughts back to suffering and suffering rightly in Jesus Christ here in 1 Peter. I encourage you to turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 3. I remind you, that the people to whom the people to whom Peter is writing, they understand something about suffering, right? I mean, these folks, they've been through it, and it's not just normal suffering. These people understand something about suffering for righteousness. They understand something about suffering for the sake of Jesus. And you know, this is during the time of of Nero, there are probably some of their family, some of their friends who have been crucified because of their faith in Jesus Christ. They probably know of some of their family or some of their friends who have been thrown to live animals to be eaten for sport. They understand the cost of suffering for righteousness' sake. We have a difficult time in the Western world. We've said this a couple of times already during this series. We have a difficult time understanding what that is. But today doesn't only serve as a warning to the people to whom Peter is speaking, saying this is very real. And in other parts of the world, Today, this is very real. People are killed, beaten, thrown in jail, removed from all of the freedom in economic society and being able to purchase goods, services when they come to faith in Jesus Christ and make that proclamation that Jesus Christ is Lord and participate in believer's baptism. They're cut off. But it's not just for them either. It is for those of us who continue to delight in and enjoy the privilege that we have, truly, without understanding the signs of the times in which we live in order to prepare appropriately for when we are faced with similar circumstances. It is good for the people of God in Western cultures to prepare for suffering for righteousness' sake now. Some of that happens, lower scale, but it's going to increase more and more. That faith in Jesus Christ and the bold proclamation of faith in Jesus Christ will cost. Are we ready? How do we respond in such circumstances? 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 13 through 17 is going to help us this morning. 1 Peter chapter 3, beginning in verse 13, the word of the Lord says this. Now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them. 
nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. Followers of Jesus who suffer as a result of righteousness should consider themselves blessed. Verse 13 and the beginning of verse 14. What's your initial response to that? Followers of Jesus who suffer as a result of righteousness should consider themselves blessed. He starts with a question. Under the superintendence of the Holy Spirit, Peter writes to those who are suffering, He doesn't ask the question, who is there that can cause you harm if you do good? Because they're already in it. We've already read that. We're going to read that again in chapter 4. There are people, while they are doing good, who are doing them harm. We're going to see in this text, the very paragraph that we're addressing today, we're going to see that It's God's will that some suffer for righteousness' sake. So what is meant here? He's asking this question to begin. And it sets our perspective from the very beginning. Who ultimately, ultimately, who can do you harm if you remain passionate for doing what is good and right In God's sight. Even for those of you who are suffering for righteousness' sake right now, the very reality of people doing harm to you in a temporal fashion right now, who ultimately can bring you to ultimate harm? Who can do that? Proper perspective. You understand why we continue to come back to the refrain of understanding the difference and distinction between playing the short game and the long game in our walk with Christ. You may suffer. In fact, it is God's will that some of us will suffer. How in the world can we think of ourselves as blessed in the midst of suffering? Well, you start with the proper perspective. Who ultimately can do you harm when you're passionate about doing what is good and right in God's sight? See, we fear the Lord. We fear the Lord who serves as the ultimate judge. Amen? Amen or no? This is a long game truth. Matthew chapter 10, the word of the Lord says this. Matthew chapter 10, beginning in verse, mm, I'll begin in verse 28. Do not fear, these are the words of Jesus, do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore. You are of more value than any number of sparrows. 
We fear the Lord who's the ultimate judge. Not those who bring us harm and cause suffering this day. That's a hard, a hard reality to grab a hold of. You've heard me say multiple times the, the instruction or the encouragement that I would give my children every day that they go out for school. We respect all persons. We fear none. You respect all persons. You fear none. Ultimately, who can do you harm? Hmm. Again, this does not mean that we will not suffer for righteousness' sake in this lifetime. As I have said, look at verse 17. Our concluding verse today, verse 17, clearly indicates that this may indeed be God's will for some of us at different times. But we are encouraged to view this kind of suffering through the viewpoint of our Lord Jesus and his view of us. Don't lose sight of that thought. I'm going to say it one more time. We're encouraged to view this kind of suffering through the viewpoint of our Lord Jesus and his view of us. The text says, even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be or are blessed. These are ringing out the words of Jesus from the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5. Go ahead and turn there with me. Matthew chapter 5. I'll read verses 10 and 11. Blessed. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. You remember the Beatitudes here? Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. I don't know about you, but that's how I feel every time somebody reviles against me. Don't you? That's how I feel every time when somebody's persecuting me. Blessed. Blessed. Hmm. When, When they speak all kinds of evil against you, and it's not true, these are Jesus' words, right? When they speak Words against you, slanderous words that aren't true against you? What's your natural thought? I'm blessed beyond measure. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. How does that work? You understand, blessed can only be understood if we can see ourselves in light of Jesus' vantage point. If I'm simply looking at me in the midst of my circumstances, guess what I don't feel? Blessed. Guess what my my thinking is not saying? You're blessed. Man, Jeff, I, I heard these people say da, 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 da. I know. I'm so blessed. You're blessed. You're blessed with me because they, they, they said this about you in the same, the same breath. Ah, blessed assurance. We're blessed together. This is a wonderful thing. How can this work? We are encouraged to view this kind of suffering through the viewpoint of our Lord Jesus and his view of us. He counts us as blessed. He says, my favor rests upon you when you suffer for righteousness' sake. My favor rests on you when you suffer for righteousness' sake. You may not feel blessed. You may not think blessed. 
But I'm telling you, when you suffer because you are faithfully following me, I need for you to see it from my vantage point. You are blessed. I am pleased with you. My favor rests on you. Please understand this, because this, I think, is where we have some weird thoughts. Our joy, our joy is not simply to be thought of as a result of the persecution. I'm being persecuted. Well, because I'm being persecuted, I am joyful. I have a settled confidence in God. Mm. I understand some teachings that bend in that direction. But here our joy is not simply to be thought of as a result of the persecution. Our joy stems from the reality that we are favored by God. He looks upon us with pleasure when we suffer faithfully as a result of faithfully following Jesus. You are blessed. The reason for your persecution is for my name's sake. And that your name has been attached to my name, you've been blessed. And that you would be persecuted as a result of your name being attached to my name makes you blessed. And that you are faithfully following me in accordance with my name. I see you as a blessed child. My blessed child. Our joy stems from the reality that we are favored by God. That Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 told us, Rejoice. Why? Rejoice, for there is great reward in heaven. Rejoice. Why? Why? Because you can recognize that you are blessed both in this day and the day to come. How? Because not only did it say that there is great reward in heaven, it secondarily said, rejoice for you are faithfully following in the footsteps of those who have gone before you. You are faithfully following in the footsteps of the prophets. And we learn that we are even following in the faithful footsteps of our Lord Jesus himself in his suffering. Called to follow Jesus in suffering? Blessed. Followers of Jesus who suffer as a result of righteousness should consider themselves blessed. Followers of Jesus who suffer as a result of righteousness must fear God above all else. Second half of verse 14 through the first half of verse 15, there are three commands, two negative, one positive. Have no fear of them. First negative command. Have no fear of them. 14, the end of verse 14, beginning of verse 15, are very close to an exact quote of the Septuagint. The Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. Of the Septuagint, Isaiah chapter 8, verses 12 through 13. I want to read that context with you, so if you would, turn with me so that we can see what Peter, under the superintendence of the Holy Spirit, is drawing from. Isaiah chapter 8, I'll read verses 11 through 15. Isaiah 8, verses 11 through 15. The word of the Lord says this. 
For the Lord spoke thus to me with his strong hand upon me and warned me not to walk in the way of this people, saying, Do not call conspiracy all that this people calls conspiracy. Do not fear what they fear, nor be in dread. That's the language we've just read. But the Lord of hosts, Yahweh, the covenant-making, covenant-keeping God, but the Lord of hosts, him you shall honor as holy. Let him be your fear. Let him be your dread. And he will become a sanctuary and a stone of offense and a rock of stumbling to both houses of Israel, a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Many shall stumble on it. They shall fall and be broken. They shall be snared and taken. This is the text. This discourse is being quoted here in 1 Peter chapter 3. That context in Isaiah chapter 8, God was speaking to and through Isaiah to the southern kingdom, to Judah. All kinds of rumors were swirling around at the time that the leaders of the northern kingdom, Israel, and the leaders along with Syria had planned an attack against them, and that attack was imminent. This is what everybody's saying. This is what is flooding both Fox News and CNN News at the time. Okay, And that's what we're listening to day in and day out. All of this swirling. We're going to be attacked. What's going to happen? Syria's joined forces with the northern kingdom. God told Isaiah and the people of Judah that they should not fear what that people feared. They should not fear what other people who are not faithfully following God are fearing. Peter then places this thought in the current context under the superintendence of the Holy Spirit. The people here, Peter is addressing, they're not fearful. The people that he's addressing, they're not fearful of a a foreign political invasion. The Roman Roman Empire at the time is pretty secure. They're, They're not worried about that. Still, followers of Jesus should not fear the things that unbelievers fear in the manner that unbelievers fear them. That's the principle that he's bringing across here. Our fear and what consumes our minds, our thinking, what consumes our emotions and our affections, what consumes our time and energy, that should be different from those who do not follow Jesus. Agreed? I think back just four years ago. In absolute amazement over what the COVID pandemic revealed about the Church of Jesus Christ and in the United States of America. So much of the church, we we feared in the same ways, about the same things, in the same respect. Little conversation about long game, little conversation about sovereignty of God, a lot of conversation about fear. It was just like anybody else's. Followers of Jesus should not fear the things that unbelievers fear in the manner that unbelievers fear them. You worried about a stock market crash? Eh. To quote my father, it's only money. Money. 
I understand that we can be concerned about our financial resources. Amen? We do not fear what happens with financial resources in the same manner that those who do not follow Christ fear about financial resources. Because our hope in both life and death is not our financial resources. I have some Reformed brothers and sisters in Christ who are thinking through the Heidelberg Catechism with me and going, that is so true. But you don't have to be from a Reformed background to understand that. It's biblical, right? Our hope in life and death is Jesus Christ and Him alone. We think differently. We're grounded differently. We view life differently. Our hope is settled differently. And so we approach life differently. Followers of Jesus should not fear the things that unbelievers fear in the manner that unbelievers fear them. Even if suffering for righteousness' sake leads to death. If that's the worst that you have for me, then I need to remind you one more time of the resurrection of my Lord Christ. Because as he lives, so shall I live with him forever. So if death is the worst you've got for me, I'm going to be okay. You know why? Back to point one. I'm blessed. We have been born again. Amen? Those of us who are embracing Jesus as Savior and Lord, we've been born again. We have a different view of the world. And we have a different view of its ultimate end. We have a different set of values. We have a different set of hopes. So, we have different things that become our ultimate concerns. Just making one more dollar for the sake of making one more dollar is not of ultimate concern to me. And it shouldn't be to followers of Jesus. Having, and you can fill in whatever tugs at your heart as a potential idol or has become a very real idol. That is not, need not be, should not be my ultimate concern. I get twisted. And my thinking and my allegiances are torn where they should not be. And I follow after the very things that those who do not follow Christ follow after. That they make preeminent and all of my culture is saying, these are the most important values. And so I kind of go along with it and say with them, these are the most important values when they are not. We chiefly and supremely value and love God. That is our testament together as the Calvary Baptist Church family stated in our articles of faith and our constitution. This command then could be stated this way. Do not give yourselves to live out the concerns that motivate unbelievers. Do not give yourselves to live out the very concerns that motivate, fundamentally motivate unbelievers. That's the outward action. The first negative command have no fear of them. Do not fear the things that unbelievers fear in the manner that unbelievers fear them. And then he goes on, and he goes one step further. Do you see it? Not only does he say, have no fear of them, he goes on and says, do not even be troubled. Just when I thought that I was doing pretty good because of the first one, he goes one step further and adds that second one. 
that I'm sure affects nobody in the sanctuary except for your pastor. This is the command. We should reject the thoughts that lead to the concerns and fears that we have just been commanded to not fear. This is what the Lord says. We should reject the thoughts that lead to the concerns and fears that we have just been commanded to not fear. This one is more difficult, I perceive. Don't be troubled. Don't be disturbed in your heart and mind. Don't be unsettled. Don't be thrown into confusion. That necessitates being very careful in which voices you allow to influence your mind. Which voices you allow to begin to shape your affections. It's one thing to not act out according to the anxious and fearful thoughts we might have residing within us. But here we are not even to contemplate or entertain the thoughts. Wow. I'm sure I'm the only person who has ever stayed awake through the night because I was thinking thoughts. that were paralyzing at times. You disagree? Say, say that again? So you're with me? Good. Good. This is hard truth. Brothers and sisters, this is hard truth. Amen to that. I know she'd be grabbing a hold of your arm right now. Yeah. But we do. The things that we want to say, and and we wouldn't let people know outwardly, the thoughts of finances, important as they may be, but the thoughts of finances, the, the, the thoughts of, well, the thoughts can of health and concern for people we love dearly and thoughts of health of our own nature, right? Thoughts of relational problems, thoughts of, and the list goes on and on. And we're thinking, how, how? And I've got to, and they become consuming. And somewhere in the midst of all that, Christ Christ becomes very small, and our problem becomes very big. In fact, our problem becomes all-consuming, and Christ is almost out of the picture. And we're being told that that needs to be completely reversed, You are not going to think through this correctly. You're not going to be able to see correctly unless Christ is central. Don't be troubled. How can we even hope to accomplish this reality? That's why close on the heels of this second negative command is that first, the third command, but the first positive command. That's why it comes so closely on the heels How might we even hope to accomplish this reality, to have no fear of them and to not be troubled? Here it is. Let your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy. Christ central. Only he can put everything else in perspective properly. Only Christ is able to enable us 
to rightly order our priorities and think correctly in all areas of life. Praise God that the Holy Spirit superintended Peter to write this way. Because we're left with that question if he doesn't give the third command. Hey, have no fear of them. Okay, I'm trying. I'm trying. Don't even be troubled with the thoughts. (laughs) I just... Then what in the world do you replace that with? In order, to, in order to remove this, what do I replace it? Replace it with the centrality of Christ the Lord is holy. You are to think, you are to understand, you are to choose differently than an unbeliever. Fear of the unknown will hold others in bondage. But proper fear and honor, the text says, reverence, of the one who has made himself known to us, frees us from fear of the unknown and provides hope in the midst of suffering. That is what is being communicated here. By God's grace and for his glory, we must keep our heads, we must guard our hearts in the midst of suffering for righteousness' sake. It is the only way that our living hope in Jesus Christ will be confidently displayed. And this kind of hope in the midst of suffering, this kind of hope in the midst of suffering allows for our faithful witness when others ask how a person can have such hope in the midst of suffering. So, followers of Jesus who suffer as a result of righteousness should consider themselves blessed. Followers of Jesus who suffer as a result of righteousness must fear God above all else. And followers of Jesus who suffer as a result of righteousness must be prepared to evangelize. In your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason. Always be prepared to make a defense. This is, this is the word from which we get our term apologetics. And again, apologetics is not making an apology or apologizing for your Christian faith. It is making a clear defense of the Christian faith. But here is what's interesting. And I don't know that we hear this enough. We often hear, and I understand it's proper, to look at 1 Peter 3.15 as, as that apologetic kind of text that is encouraging you to defend your faith. But that's not what it's telling you to defend, is it? I mean, in one sense it is. Because without faith, you do not have hope. But it's clear that what it is telling us to do, you are to make a reasoned defense. A reasoned defense to anyone who may ask you. But this is in the context of suffering for righteousness' sake. This is in the context of you not fearing people or circumstances. Where do you get that kind of confidence? This is in light of you and my observation, others' observation of you. You're not even dealing with the thoughts that lead to those kinds of actions. What kind of person is able to have that kind of, what's the word in the text? Hope. This could even be coming from the very people who are persecuting you. I've done everything, it seems like, that I possibly can do to this person. They still have hope. I've tried to squash the living hope out of them. 
And the more I try to squash the living hope out of them, all it winds up doing is oozing out of them, and it's driving me nuts. Paul gets beaten, and Silas, they get thrown in jail. Hey, you know what? My ministry is actually accentuated when I'm in jail, when I'm in prison. What? Who thinks that way? Followers of Jesus. I tell you what we should do. What's that? Well, um... Silas, what's your, what's your favorite hymn that just talks about the goodness of God and his saving grace in Jesus Christ? Well, it'd be this one. Why don't we sing that one? Here, in prison? Yeah. Cool. And no doubt, other people who are in prison are going, what in the world is with these guys? I mean, I've heard the stories of all kinds of other things that have happened to them as well. I'm surprised they're not dead yet. They could very well die, but they're in prison. And what is going on? They sing songs of hope because of the Lord Jesus Christ. They know that no one can ultimately do them harm. They don't fear what other people fear. They don't dwell on the things. They are moved by, motivated by the same things that other people are moved by and motivated by. They so intensely, deeply love the Lord Jesus Christ that the only one that they can give themselves to worship in the pit of suffering is Jesus with the fullness of hope that you are making all things good, right, beautiful, just, and wise. And I long for the fullness of that. And I trust you for that. You, no one, can take that hope away from me. For there is nothing that can separate me from the love of God in Jesus. Jesus Christ, who is my hope. That's the reality. That's what's being communicated here. Who has that kind of hope? Always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. And when you do so, even with those who are the very ones persecuting you, You do so with gentleness and respect. You respect all persons, but you fear none. For the purpose of God ultimately vindicating your faith and faithfulness, either in this time frame or in the final judgment, people who have persecuted you spoken falsely and evil against you when you have sought and done the good for Jesus' namesake. That the Lord Jesus ultimately vindicates your faith and your faithfulness and says, my child did right. And you spoke and did evil against them. And perhaps we'll see that person who has done the persecution see the hope that we have and say, give me a good reason why you hope. And we speak to them Jesus and the gospel of our Lord Christ. And perhaps God is pleased to redeem them for his name's sake. And we rejoice that a new brother or sister has been brought into the family. Or perhaps my life is taken and I await the final judgment. And the Father says, Well done, good and faithful servant. Well done in faithfully following my son. Even when I willed for you suffering for my name's sake. All the false accusations against you, I have seen them for what they are. Enter into your eternal rest and delight in what I have prepared for you. Who ultimately 
will do you harm. No one. So what do I do? I hope. And I honor Christ above all as holy. And then I witness and give testimony of the hope that is within me. Because the paragraph ends, concludes very simply. It's better to suffer for doing good. If that should be God's will for you, then you are blessed in suffering for doing good. Because certainly that's better than suffering for doing evil. Because that's all on you and me. Amen. Followers of Jesus who suffer as a result of righteousness should consider themselves blessed. Followers of Jesus who suffer as a result of righteousness must fear God above all else. Followers of Jesus who suffer as a result of righteousness must be prepared to evangelize. God will be honored. We will be blessed. Our Father in heaven, thank you for the morning. Thank you for this wonderful paragraph. Please, Father, mold us and shape us so that we be conformed to the image of your Son more intensely, more deeply. That we would not fear what unbelievers fear in the manner that they fear those things, but that we would revere and honor and fear you and you alone. And we would suffer for doing what's right in a way that is pleasing to you with the fullness of hope that you will be pleased in the moment and you will vindicate the faithfulness of your saints when we stand before you. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of our Lord. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Go in his grace and peace.